Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I first just want to give so much gratitude to the organizers and the visionaries behind this conference, um, this symposium. It's really such a timely and important topic, and the group of people who have raised their hands to be a part of it are just some of the most interesting and um, provocative thinkers on these issues that we have and practitioners on these issues that we have. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. I'm actually here right now on campus at the University of Chicago as an Institute of Politics fellow. Um, so I teach a seminar on policy advocacy every week uh, and have office hours twice a week for students here. Um, find it on the IOP website. I'd love to engage in this conversation even further with you. So I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to tell you about who these amazing people are, and then we're going to hear from each of them in turn. And then we're going to get to, I think, all of our favorite part, which is a, um, a dialogue with all of you. So um, uh, I'm just going to read uh, the br a brief version of their bios, just so you know uh, in whose presence you sit. Um, we first have Alyssa. Alyssa Battistoni is a political theorist and environmental fellow at Harvard. She works on topics related to political economy, environmental politics, feminism, and the history of political thought. She writes about related issues for various publications, including Dissent, N Plus One, The Nation, Jacobin, where she's on the editorial board. Her book, A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal, co-written with Kate Aronoff, uh, Daniel uh, Cohen, and Thea uh, Rio Francos, is out this fall? In a month. <laughs> Pre-order now uh, with Verso. Thank you so much, Alyssa, for being with us. Um, at the end uh, is Yarimar Bonilla. She's a professor uh, in the Department of Africana, Puerto Rican, and Latino Studies at Hunter College, and in the PhD program in Anthropology at the Graduate Center at CUNY, the University of New York. She's the author of Non-Sovereign Futures, French Caribbean Politics in the Wake of Disenchantment from University of Chicago Press an editor of Aftershocks of Disaster, Puerto Rico Before and After the Storm from Haymarket, hey, um, this year. Um, Professor Bonilla's next book project is called Shattered Futures, and she is doing that with a 2018 Carnegie Fellowship, where she examines the politics of recovery in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria and the forms of political and social trauma that the storm reveals. She's also at work on an ethnographic study of the pro-statehood movement tentatively titled The Unthinkable State. Nice. Not tentative, it's good, it's good. <laughs> Which traces how and why annexationism is a form of anti-colonial politics. Welcome and thank you. Aziz Rana is a professor of law at Cornell Law School. His research and teaching center on American constitutional law and political development with a particular focus of how shifting notions of race, citizenship, and empire have shaped legal and political identity since the founding. His book, The Two Faces of American Freedom, from Harvard University Press, situates the American experience within the global history of colonialism, examining the intertwined relationship in American constitutional practice between internal accounts of freedom and external projects of power and expansion. He's currently at work on a manuscript exploring the modern rise of constitutional veneration in the 20th century, especially against the backdrop of glowing American global authority, and how veneration has influenced the boundaries of popular politics. And last, but everything but least, is Barbara Ransby. Um, she's currently a distinguished professor in the Department of African American Studies, Gender and Women's Studies and History at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she direct, directs the powerful campus-wide social justice initiative um, which is a project that promotes connections between academics and community organizers doing work on social justice. Um, Dr. Ransby is author of two award-winning books, Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, A Radical Democratic Vision from University of North Carolina Press, and Islanda, The Large and Unconventional Life of Mrs. Paul Robeson from Yale University Press. She's also of a third book published in 2018 entitled Making All Black Lives Matter, Reimagining Freedom in the 21st Century from the University of California Press. Um, and Dr. Ransby is uh, just, uh, in addition to being a you know, prolific writer and academic and professor, is one of the uh, great mentors to so many of us in, in the movement for black liberation. So thank you for being with us. OK, so we are going to hear first from 
I know. Is that it? I just wanted to see if someone would leap forward. Yeah, from, from Melissa. From Melissa. Um, uh, yeah. Will you make sure your mic is on by oh, a little switch? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so thank you everyone for coming, for being here, for all of the great presentations this morning, which I, I certainly learned a lot from. And I'll just say I'm you know neither a populism scholar nor particularly attached to populism per se, but I am really interested in how we get to a democratic and popular uh, climate politics. And I think that's particularly important because climate and more generally environmental politics have probably been the last thing people think about as being uh, uh, a multiracial populist movement, any kind of populist or democratic or popular movement. Um, they're typically thought of as sort of uh, white middle class issue as environmental, um, environmentalism is thought of that, uh, or a politics of experts and elites almost against the people, the imposition of sort of uh, expert um, uh, uh, policies and rule against sort of uh, you know popular demands, um, and so it's often suggested that democratic politics isn't up to dealing with climate change. Um, and you need to sort of impose these these sacrifices or restrictions on people against their will. Um, there's this sort of uh, you know people need to sacrifice for the benefit of, of future generations or distant others. People don't understand the science. They won't um, accept limits to consumption and so on. So this is I think the narrative that you typically hear around climate change um, and uh, in um, and environmental politics more generally, but specifically climate, uh, and I think it's a bad one. <laughs> um, but I do think that when you see things like there was a vote against the carbon tax in Washington State, uh, the Gilets Jaunes protests in France, um, recent protests against the end of fuel subsidies in Ecuador, I think some people read these as uh, con confirmation of this idea that democratic uh, societies won't accept sacrifices or sort of uh, restrictions of the standard of living which are taken to be necessary to address climate change. and so. Um, I, I would say that those kinds of events reveal not a, a democratic failure on climate, but um, the limits of neoliberal approaches to climate policy, which um, are imposing costs on people who have already been uh, bearing both the cost of economic crisis and harm for decades, and also in, uh, often environmental costs and the social and environmental costs of, um, you know, of capital externalizing of those costs. So uh, while failing to address the broader social and economic issues that are really at the heart of <laughs> Um, the, the causes of climate change. And so the book that um, is coming out in a few weeks, which, yeah, pre-order, uh, that I co-wrote with Thea, uh, who was speaking this morning, um, and Daniel Cohen and Kay Aronoff is, is trying to argue for why the Green New Deal is uh, a way to, um, to, to bring about a broader transformation of uh, economy and society that brings benefits to people in the present rather than sort of this uh, sacrifice for the future narrative. Um, that tackles the entrenched power of fossil capital and the sort of way that the, that their social environmental costs have been externalized um, to the public and particularly communities of color and working class people. So um, we so we're arguing for the Green New Deal uh, and and this kind of what I think is the more expansive vision of the Green New Deal that you know is always picking up and running from the the Green New Deal resolution that uh, AOC and, and Markey put out uh, in February and got a bunch of people to sign on to. I think Anna is totally right that it was a very interesting organizing tool and kind of set of, uh, you know, set of demands that was, that was much more uh, ambitious and aggressive than anything I've seen, certainly in climate policy, and that I think actually pushed, um, you know, you got all of these Democrats who don't support, uh, who would probably not have signed on to a lot of, of the, the components of it, um, things like guaranteed people housing and jobs and so on. Um, had signed onto this thing, which is, I think, a very interesting thing to try to hold people to. Um, but the response to it was also, well, this goes too far. It's too radical. It's uh, it's hard enough to get to no uh, to net zero carbon um, in you know ten years, twenty years, <laughs> any number of years. Um, why would you also add all these social programs on? What do social programs have to do with climate change? Um, and so I think you know the argument we're trying to make, uh, and that I think is pertinent to this conversation, is that the effective Green New Deal is what we think of as a radical Green New Deal, but not radical in the sense of marginal, but a radical Green New Deal that really is trying to get at the roots of a lot of the, the problems, um, uh, the source of climate change that's, that's bringing these sorts of, um, bringing attention to the ways that climate and environmental issues are bound up in uh, a broader society and economy and that we actually need to sort of change all of that to, uh, uh, to actually address climate change. We can't just sort of have this, um, you know, very narrow climate policy that's 
just focus on energy infrastructure, uh, a carbon tax, and some like maybe some research and development funding. Um, that's that's something that people are not supposed to notice happening. <laughs> you fix climate change sort of through uh, these backdoor solutions, something like I think the Clean Power Plan, just executive action that you can just uh, do while nobody's paying attention um, without having uh, the that that you do when you don't have you know the Senate, Congress, these these problems that that Daniel was speaking to earlier. There are real political problems to overcome, but I don't think you overcome them by um, you know, trying to sneak some executive action through, you need to actually build those kinds of uh, mass popular movements. Um, and that means that we have to, again, connect the, the, the climate and environmental question to um, economic and social questions. And so, and I think, I will say also that um, I really don't think there's an alternative uh, because I think there is no constituency for green austerity or green neoliberalism other than uh, capital, basically. And uh, green austerity I think is very dangerous right now um, in the context that Mo described, where uh, the right is suggesting we are in scarcity mode, your gains or other people's gains come at your expense. Uh, whereas I think that public abundance is absolutely necessary to live within ecological limits, and we need to divorce the sort of talking about ecological, uh, the, the way that the language of austerity often creeps into environmental discourse and saying, well, you know, we all have to accept limits and limits, and we need to be thinking actually public resources are really necessary to live good lives uh, in non resource intensive ways. So. Um, at the same time, I really do think that climate uh, uh, we climate action really could stand to amp up the mobilization against you know the sort of elites, wealthy corporations that are often associated with this populism, as we saw in earlier panels. Um, you know, it's not that it has to be done in a populist way, but I really think that the, the, the standard narrative. Um, around sort of culpability uh, when it comes to climate change tends to be like, we're all culpable, we're all complicit, we all use fossil fuels. You know, it's it's human nature, it's the Anthropocene, and I think we can say, well, no, it's the capital scene and maybe the racial capital scene, uh, but also that we need to, yeah, yeah, uh, the plantation of scenes, people have called it, um, but we need, to, we need to actually, I think, really uh, channel more of the energy of um, the anger and, and frustration into, um, uh, pointing to, like we talk about consumption, it needs to be the consumption of the wealthy who have uh, are much more responsible for carbon emissions um, than uh, other people. You know, like uh, we had a piece in this series that Thea and Daniel and Kate and I have edited, you know, points like a ban on private debt. So this is very basic stuff, but like, you know, consumption, it's not, uh, you know, you commuting to work every day. That's like your, you have the same amount of culpability as um, you know, the, whatever, like the Davos, going to like a climate conversation at Davos on the private plane. Um, so we need to be talking about, uh, trying to direct, I think, some of the, um, I guess, like blame conversation in that direction. I mean, also to talk about the ways uh, that, that there has been an active dismantling of uh, unions, public power that has strengthened actively the fossil fuel sector in particular, um, handed big oil tax rule breaks, regulatory rollbacks, and that that's happened under Democratic administrations too. Um, Obama has boasted over presiding over like a drastic expansion of fossil fuel extraction that made America the world's largest producer. So I do think we need to really figure out that. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about a few concrete demands, or some of the areas we discussed in the book around like some of the concrete demands that this might entail and what this looks like in a more concrete way, because I do think that most of the comment that we, you know, we start by having some, some places to, to build around is important. And so, um, so I'll just I'll say something briefly about the, the four areas that we talk about in the book. Um, so first is, is, is you know, uh, dismantling fossil fuels and, and stopping the fossil fuel industry. Um, because uh, you can build a lot of green energy, but if you don't get rid of the fossil fuels, then it doesn't really help. Um, and you know, I do think that means, as I've been suggesting, sort of tackling fossil capital head on. Um, and I think that really is one of the places where we see um, something like the environmental justice movement as articulating that kind of uh, Kambiki universalism that was alluded to in the first panel, but where actually if we had been listening to um, the, uh, the critique made by uh, communities of color around environmental, the cost of, uh, of fossil fuel, everything from sort of power plants to toxic waste dumping, um, and the, the way that those effects are dumped onto certain people, um, we would have been, I think, thinking about how to transition to cleaner forms of energy a long time ago, um, and thinking about how to stop emissions at their source is really crucial, and so um, that's certainly one place. And then the other is, of course, the uh, anti-pipeline activism that has been led by indigenous communities, so uh, in the wake of Dapple and Houston XL, and so on. Um, I think 
we really need to be thinking, okay, how do we both expand these kinds of movements to stop emissions at the source, uh, which we really have to do. And um, uh, Nick Estes' book, is Art History of the Future, is really interesting in articulating both, I think, the possibilities and limits of some of the um, attempts at, at a, you know, uh, multiracial and really like cross kind of uh, different kinds of community organizing um, to keep it in the ground or against pipelines. Um, but uh, of course, this has been that has also been a site of a lot of resistance. Where the next the next thing I'm going to talk about is labor, and um, you know there have been long-standing tensions between labor and environmental politics, which tend to sort of um, you do see in the anti-pipeline movements where you have fossil fuel labor or extractive industry labor um, aligned with fossil capital against the sort of like climate, uh, environmental justice, indigenous movements. Um, and so we really do need to tackle that. Um, and uh, so uh, we do argue following Fred Scott King and the movement for Black Lives Platform and others who have thought through the jobs guarantee, but I think a jobs guarantee, which as Kathy's research shows is popular, uh, can offer um, both a commitment, I think an important commitment to security through a transition that is going to be pretty rocky, I think at times. Um, but, and you know, that also has, uh, I think important, um, that has an important aspect in terms of attacking racial disparities in employment that are uh, at least still with us today. Um, we also argue that, um, so I think the job guarantee has, you know, we, there are a lot of different kinds of jobs that we can think of to, that will need to uh, sort of rebuild the world in a, in a no carbon direction. Um, and I think there are important things to do to, to basically assure people who are working extractive industry jobs that they will not pay for the, you know, basically the decisions made by the bosses of those companies. Um, but we also want to expand the vision of green jobs um, and to say it's not just sort of like work to retrofit homes, direct wind turbines, solar arrays, transmission lines. Um, we should also be thinking about uh, the other kinds of jobs that are essential to a green economy. And I would say that things like care work, nursing, teaching, uh, jobs that are basically improving people's quality of life, sort of socially beneficial uh, and not resource intensive are really crucial. Um, so I see CTU as part of the low carbon labor movement. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of really interesting potential to build, um, I guess this is both a potential and a really big challenge is how to build labor alliances um, and rebuild the labor movement that is, that is sort of building a, an alliance for a Green New Deal across extractive industry workers who are mostly white men. Um, and the women who are doing these kinds of uh, care, nursing, teaching, et cetera, jobs, uh, particularly women of color and immigrant women um, when it comes to things like care work. Uh, care work, also, we want to think about care for the earth. Um, Nick has written about how indigenous communities are doing uh, green jobs um, in caretaking for the land, caretaking for the earth uh, that is not currently recognized or awarded. Um, and I think, and so we support the, new uh, the Red Deal's call for that and to recognize that, but I think there's also opportunities there to reach uh, farmers, immigrant farm workers, to organize agriculture in a different way um, that actually incorporates care for the earth um, and that maybe is able to transcend some of the, or not transcend, but to, to work across these urban-rural divides that were mentioned, although there's obviously challenges uh, there too. Um, uh, I should stop in a minute, so I'll just say briefly, we also are, um, when it comes to things like the energy transition, um, the energy transition isn't just about swapping in like one energy source for another. We need to think about how energy is embedded in everyday life. So everything from transit to housing to landscapes. Um, we saw, uh, people probably saw the PG&E shut off in California the other week. Um, and in instances like that, where the power private utility is shutting down power because they have been negligent in maintaining uh, their own infrastructure to prevent um, fires that have killed uh, you know, dozens of people in recent years. Um, some communities had their own microgrids uh, to back up, you know, so they, you can you can run your own power system um, when the, the broader grid goes off, but um, that is really only going to be an option for, um, in general, for, um, for wealthy people and probably wealthy white people. Uh, and we should think about that as a form of solar separatism that's not that different from private schools and healthcare uh, and, and be thinking about we actually need a public grid um, as we have situations like that in the future. Um, but we also need to transform the built environment to cut energy demand in ways that are uh, good for people's lives. So housing is a really huge part of this. Um, and I think building out uh, both carbon-free public housing 
um, hopefully linked to some of the demands we've seen coming out in recent months for a, a housing guarantee or housing for all. Um, uh, in the sort of, you know, you see in like green urbanism, a lot of talk about density and like density is so great, um, but that usually doesn't address the ways that density in urban areas um, is also, uh, they're, they're not thinking about gentrification and really think about the way that uh, the sort of move into dense urban areas uh, by wealthy white people is, is displacing working class people, people of color, um, and that we actually need a lot of dense <laughs> housing in, uh, dense affordable housing in places that have you know things that people want in their lives that is accessible and affordable um uh that's also connected public transportation obviously so we don't have uh the same um so everyone's not reliant on uh you know driving their car around um and in general projects that construct um you know the kinds of things that we think of as or we argue is, is uh, low carbon leisure and public leisure um, that, that sees decarbonization not as a deprivation, but as a form of public luxury. So um, everything from you know urban swimming pools to rural biking trails, and I think that that will, of course, run into some of the, the difficulties you know that I think Mo was mentioning around segregation in things like uh, you know the the shutting down the pool rather than letting black people use it. Like we, I'm sure, will still face these kinds of um, challenges if we try to articulate a vision of public luxury. But I think we should be talking about that. Um, and the last thing I'll say really briefly, which I'm sure um, will connect more to both Aziz and Yariamar's uh, remarks, but thinking about the implications of the Green New Deal beyond U.S. borders, um, uh, you know, green tech is not necessarily green everywhere. Uh, the, the lithium and, and cobalt and copper and all of these things that go into renewable energy come from somewhere, and they mostly come from not the U.S. And so uh, we think that we should be thinking about, uh, actually how to um, have a, a trade policy that can um, respond to the right to talk on free trade and have a left response to that, but one that is trying to put environmental labor standards at the forefront, that's trying to build solidarity across um, you know, workers and uh, you know, mines in Chile and workers uh, and like the Tesla factory in the US. And how can we imagine that um, being a source instead of just kind of like the UN as the only site of international climate politics, how can we be building that kind of international solidarity um, through uh, the, the you know supply chains through the the you know the flows of the global economy. So um, I will stop there. Thank you for listening, and I'll just say like to put a polite spin on on Mo's opening remarks, the the sort of facing socialism uh, or or barbarism question. Like I really do think we're facing eco socialism or eco apartheid, but the latter is here. Um, it will it will only intensify. You know we're seeing it uh, in Hurricane Maria in cyclones destroying, you know, killing thousands of people in Mozambique. Climate change, it's not a future thing, it's a, it's a here thing. And so we really, um, the, the current situation, we're, we are on track for, you know, the, the climate barbers and eco-apartheid. And so we really need to be thinking about how do we turn that ship around. So I look forward to everyone else's comments and to all of your thoughts, so thanks. Um, so I, I think the first thing that I'd like to say as well is just thank you for um, being here, everyone in the room, um, and for your intellectual generosity and seriousness. Um, so for my focus uh, in, in grappling with this question of what do we want, um, I'd like to spend some time talking about the international. And because one of the things that we want is an emancipatory politics for the international arena. Uh, 
And to me, the heart <clears throat> of any kind of emancipatory approach has to be one that directly intertwines domestic freedom struggles with a full-throated account of the limitations and problems of American global power and its international application. Um, what I'd like to do is spend maybe the first half of my comments talking about why doing this has been so hard in the US, making that link, and then maybe the second half on well, what, would, what would it substantively entail to pursue this, this path. Like if we just think about politics in the US in recent decades, really in many ways right up to the present with very kind of uh, um, limited um, sort of sites of opposition. One of the most significant sites of opposition is precisely in that vision statement for the movement uh, for black lives, which includes centrally as part of its idea of invest, divest, a direct linking between how the US operates abroad and what it does at home. That American politics has been marked by a fundamental divide between the domestic and the foreign. So the domestic is where you make claims that are about bread and butter issues of your own material interest, what happens in your daily life. And the foreign instead is this space that's essentially supervised by national security elites based on a kind of expertise that, that they then play with through various types of geostrategic uh, competition. Um, that these two things are not necessarily meant to be connected to the extent that you have social movement politics about the international. It's really exclusively been the anti-war movement, and the anti-war movement for all of its pluses, you know, I've taken to the streets at various points in my adult life, um, has largely been driven by specific episodes like the Iraq War and organized through a politics of conscience. In other words, don't do X in my name, rather than something that's actually linked in a sustained way to the material experiences of people domestically, where what the US is doing abroad is actually substantively transforming your opportunities to be free. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the things that this cleavage also does, and this is where you know, I think if you take seriously the, the domain of, of the international, what happens is you start pressing against the boundaries not just of populism or a notion of the people, but really of nationalism itself. Because the cleaving is based on the idea that you share more in common with somebody that is also a formal citizen, and so is a co-national part of what Barbara called we the people, than with folks that are oppressed, colonized, abroad. And that somehow other co-nationals that enjoy power act in your own interests. And this is a kind of thinking that I think fundamentally undermines any possibility of emancipatory politics. And it's why if you take seriously the international, I think at the end of the day, you have to press against really most of the nationalist rhetoric that marks American politics. And that might be something that we have to, to struggle with in terms of what that means for an electoral coalition. OK, so first thing to note is that for large chunks of the 20th century, really I'm going to talk here in broad strokes, but especially the first half of the 20th century, the major freedom movements in the United States, and you can think of feminist politics, indigenous politics, labor movement, uh, the black freedom struggle, I'm gonna talk in particular about the latter two, had very clear international wings, where you had radical activists that made the argument that not only were they intersectionally related, that they, they were structurally connected to a, um, an oppressive society that reproduced various forms of hierarchy, but that the only way that you could actually achieve freedom was through something like an independent foreign policy that contested the prerogatives and dictates of the states. Mm -hmm. So the way that this played out quickly in the context of labor was the idea that the society is itself internally marked by fundamental class cleavages. This means that the state represents the interests of those that enjoy business and class power, and that precisely because it reproduces capital's prerogatives abroad, you couldn't sign up to the projects of the state and what it was doing internationally because that was actually undermining your own class status and position domestically. Now with the, the black freedom struggle, you had uh, alongside a class analysis, you also had analysis that was grounded in ideas of racial capitalism and colonialism that said the US is not incompletely liberal. Instead, it is founded on a particular kind of colonial project that project means that it's much more like um, South, apartheid South Africa than decolonizing India. And for this reason, to sign up to the prerogatives of the state, again, is essentially to pick sides 
with apartheid defenders against people that you actually have solidarity with, those that are colonized. And you see this in the international dimensions of, um, of black radical politics. Take, for example, the NAACP's own, like, We Appeal to the World in uh, 40, uh, 47, uh, 48, actually. And then also you can take um, We Charge Genocide, which I think is an even more significant expression of this. So We Charge Genocide from 1951. This is the uh, Civil Rights Congress. Um, written in conjunction with a number of significant African-American figures. So you have William Patterson, Du Bois, Robeson, um, Claudia Jones, and the entire framing <clears throat> highlights the fact that you cannot presume solidarity or community with those that are actually participating in your own oppression at home. And it requires a, a kind of a global account of both the forms of hierarchy that exist domestically, but also the modes of alliance that could actually uproot them. So what happens to this mode of thinking about <laughs> politics? The Cold War, simply. Like, I mean, that's, uh, maybe this is just a schematic way of presenting it. And it happens through um, massive crackdowns on radical organizing. So just take We Charge Genocide and those names that I mentioned. What happens to the, the great uh, Marxist Claudia Jones, black feminist? Um, she's put in jail. She's ultimately deported. What happens to Robeson? Robeson uh, his, his passport is taken away from him. He's blacklisted internally. He's essentially made an internal exile. Du Bois, du Bois has his passport also taken away from him. He's um, tried on trumped up political charges and eventually he ends up um, leaving the country. Patterson too is harassed. So there's an entire systematic approach of violence. But there's something else that I think has to be reckoned with, which is the way in which the Cold War prerogatives of the national security state actually provided real positive ends to elements of both labor and the African-American civil rights movement in ways that eventually kind of co-opted large chunks of these movements into service on behalf of the security state. So labor's story. Labor has a series of achievements that it ends up enjoying in the 30s and 40s. And it finds that these achievements <clears throat> Um, require, this is the, the leadership in the, the 40s and early 50s, like these achievements in order to be preserved, things like collective bargaining, require participating in a state, business, labor, tripart, tripartite settlement. And that if you want to maintain those benefits that, that were achieved and fought for through strikes and struggle, then you have to you know, refrain from challenging the national security prerogatives. And that's a kind of pragmatic compromise. But it's a pragmatic compromise that's also sustained by two other things. First, the reality that the Soviet Union and Stalinism in particular is, a partic is an authoritarian project. And so that there's real concern and suspicion about the nature of, of political authoritarianism that ends up dividing activists in various ways. And then secondly, and this is even more significant and that has to be confronted today, um, the extent that social democracy as understood by the New Deal itself and this is part of the ways in which it was racialized, was fundamentally an imperial project. The, the funding that, that spurs the economy, that spurs uh, white working class economic improvements in the 40s and 50s, is built on the militarization of the economy, the expansion of industrialization and the military industrial comp com uh, complex. And also, not just during World War II, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the security state's global project of promoting business alliances internationally and using those business alliances to feed the uh, domestic economic growth. And there's a, there's a thing that actually happened, which is for many white male workers, and again, it's a, a circumscribed category, but for many of those within this category, to the extent that they experienced quote unquote liberation, it was during this period which is precisely a low tide for many other communities. And that's a basic problem in thinking about the relationship between social democracy and empire. And then you can say something very similar about what happens with the civil rights movement. The high tide for civil rights legislative electoral success is the 50s and 60s, 60s especially, and it is absolutely in the context of the Cold War and the fight for hearts and minds in the global south. And it produces not just generations of Cold War liberals, but a particular kind of politics within African-American communities that's expressed in both parties by folks like Obama, but also by Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell, 
where precisely the achievement of the Civil Rights Project is that now you can have African Americans that are engaged in running a security state that's actually reproducing the violence internationally. And of course, all of this is then undergirded <clears throat> by a very particular kind of electoral wisdom, which is you can't confront the national security state. You know, McGovern tried doing that in 1972, and that way lies madness. And then moreover, with the end of the draft, you also don't have clear kind of like institutional spaces to be able to say that, well, you know, actually there should be mass popular contestation of what's happening um, internationally because the military, even if it's drawn overwhelmingly from rural and poor, including black and brown communities that end up suffering under the weight of the national security state, it's a volunteer army that's closed off and effectively for American purposes privatized. Now, all of this has long run and truly traumatic effects. Like, so we can just think about two very quickly. So one is, just like those early activists, what ends up happening with foreign policy? Foreign policy is driven by, by the mobility of capital and the ways in which the goals of capital from austerity to privatization to the protection of um, uh, corporate property rights end up destroying labor movements abroad and undermining the global position of capital with rippling effects from the 70s on domestically. And then the second, the national security project itself reproduces various forms of pacification and population management that, of course, come back home to black and brown communities to serve as the basis of the policing that we see domestically. It's why the idea of from Ferguson to Gaza is not just a metaphor, but is actually a concrete instantiation of how national security prerogatives reproduce forms of power. Now, the thing that's noteworthy about this moment that makes it really exciting in its own way is that we've, we're now on the other end of this. We've had rolling crises around the, social, around the national security state. We've dealt with the after effects of the Iraq war. So there is a public that is open to direct th challenges to this national security framework. And, and indeed, it's also in a setting where you don't have the kind of existential threats, like either the Soviet Union <coughs> or Nazi Germany, that can kind of facilitate or feed right-wing ethno-nationalism, though, though God knows there are many ways that that could be fed regardless. And for all of the, you know, the terrors of the Trump years, one of the things that America First does is America First and the Trump rhetoric is all about linking the domestic and the foreign, about talking about protectionism, about talking about the border. Now, of course, it's done so to racialize and demonize and other as a basis of maintaining a kind of class deference at home, but it provides another opening. Now, in this space, there have been a bunch of kind of emerging sort of left, left wing activists, sort of uh, academics, think tank types that are coming up with, with white papers. And we can think of how these ideas should be organized. They should be organized on a principle of anti imperialism that rejects international police power of the US state that says that. <clears throat> that no community should be treated as an instrument for the pursuit of domestic security prerogatives. Um, it can be built on uh, democratic socialism rather than austerity, on a principle of do no harm that has limitations on the use of force, but also a commitment to legal constraint both by the US state and its allies and to impunity, um, a demobilizing of the national security state alongside the end of hyper and mass incarceration here domestically. But all of these ideas, to get off the ground require mass commitment. Just like with Medicare for all. There's been discussions of like national health insurance in the US for decades. It's only now in the context of mass politics that it's actually something that's a, a serious, viable political project. And that means that just as in the past, the central thing is to, to figure out ways to make internationalist claims that are tied to material demands to make those material demands in internationalist terms. And I'd say that there are three basic sites of contestation. I know that I'm over, so I'm just going to present them, and then we can talk about them later. One has to be over the budget and thinking about the meaning of the budget. This is the divest, invest. But it also has to be based on a recognition that the military budget is the last vestige of the New Deal order. It's actually the place that provides jobs and money and funding to particular kinds of rural communities. And that means that you can't just get rid of the budget without effectively something like a Green New Deal. Two, it means a politics that's about ending impunity, that has a different account of trade, 
that's built on the idea that if there's a global oligarchy, this is the stuff that Sanders has been best on, then that global oligarchy has to be contested at home and abroad and that these two things are connected. Having a guaranteed job here is, a, is connected to imposing economic and labor standards as well as ensuring that, that there's uh, you know, impositions on all of the different elements of a corporate supply chain. And then the third thing, which I think is probably the hardest, frankly, for the language of populism, is the border itself. Mm -hmm. Contesting the imperative of the border and not just saying we're going to be more moral in how we treat those that remarkably somehow end up finding themselves at our border, but rather we're going to understand the border as a continuing site for the construction of American power and hegemony, mm -hmm. and that that means decriminalizing it and providing extensive political rights, mm -hmm. and that this is the only way ultimately that you can break the kind of um, you know, false class narrative that somehow Trump can say that you know, poor white workers are actually more threatened than by foreign workers than their own domestic capitalist abettors. Now, each of these are non-reformist reforms, and I have some more specific, smaller ones that we can talk about. But the point is, again, just as in the domestic, to use international spaces as a site for ensuring, <coughs> ensuring that the social order is itself harder to be reproduced, like making it more difficult for hierarchy to sustain itself in every one of its settings. Um, so, so when um, when uh, an email went out asking our panel, you know, just say what you're gonna what you're gonna talk about in, in, in broad strokes, and I said I'm not entirely sure, but I want to rip off a tweet that I uh, that I uh, posted a while back ago, where I you know, said, "Dear allies, when feeling the need to assert that Puerto Ricans are fellow U.S. citizens." Take a moment and ask yourself if what really needs to be asserted is that the U.S. is an empire. And so the, the reason I tweeted this out was because I had been on a morning edition that morning, that morning talking about the uh, political movement in Puerto Rico over the summer. And, you know, I got very excited or passionate about the things. I don't, and, you know. And I guess at some point in it, I referred to Puerto Rico as distinct from the United States. Um, and so the uh, you know heteronormative white male host uh, felt the need at the end of the segment to correct me and tell me you know just you know uh, Professor Bonilla I don't want anyone adding you you know asking you on the on the social on, the, on social media so you know we should just take a moment to you know to say clearly you know you understand that Puerto Rico is, Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens and are part of the United States. And, and you know, meanwhile, the producers in my ear, one second. You know, so I can't, I can't say what I would have liked to say, which would have been actually, no, Puerto Rico is not part of the U.S. We belong to the U.S. and this is the legal, this is the actual legal language is Puerto Rico belongs to, is not part of the United States. And yes, we are citizens, um, but it's a non-consensual, second-class citizen. Then I would have just had, I would have needed a whole other segment, right? <laughs> so, so instead, I just said, uh, y yes. <laughs> and, I, and it was this moment of feeling completely disciplined yeah, yeah. into my non-consensual citizenship. So, you know, of course, I, I, I did what any normal person would do, which would be to subtweet about it. <laughs> so, um, I, I feel like it's, like it's important. And so, the, the other, the, so I, wanna, I wanted to just say a, a few things about this tweet and, and, the, and why I wrote it the way I did. Um, so, uh, for me, I think uh, beyond the, the annoying, um, you know, NPR, uh, host. Um, this is something that happens a lot and also particular in, in, in the wake of Hurricane Maria where people are like, oh, we have to care about Puerto Rico, we have to do something for them because they're U.S. citizens. And so I'm sure this is not a crowd where I have to explain too much what's wrong with that, right? Um, but one of the problems with this is, of course, that it silences U.S. empire. And so it, by saying that Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens, there's this kind of a, a idea that, that this is resolved, you know? And, and the, pro, the, the fact is that we're not uh, US citizens. As one of my friends says, we are colonial subjects with passports. And, and the passport is important because mobility is important and decriminalizing and abolishing the border is important. 
Um, but but to, to, we also need to rethink this idea of citizenship itself for anyone as solving the problem, as bringing inclusion, right? And so to simply assert, oh, they're citizens, oh, they're good, then that means there's no problems because, you know, obviously U.S. citizens get all the hurricane aid that they need, right? Mm -hmm. So to kind of question that idea of citizenship as a solution to also historical um, oppression, or et cetera. Um, the other thing is, of course, um, that we don't want to reassert that you have to be a citizen to matter. Non-citizens also matter, and we don't really want to reassert citizenship as the entry point into political participation and political rights. Um, in addition to that, you know, to like, well, why should we move away from thinking about citizenship and thinking instead towards empire? Is also because there is an incredible, amazing, astounding structural silence around U.S. empire. And when people talk about U.S. empire, what they think about is this international realm, and not the fact that the U.S. is not imperialistic in, in, or act, acts as an empire, but the U.S. is an empire with territories. Um, so if you go to Wikipedia, as all good undergraduates tend to do, um, and you look for the definition of imperialism, it's astounding that it does not talk about U.S. territories at all. So US, American imperialism describes policies aimed at extending the political, economic, and cultural control of the United States over areas beyond <coughs> its boundaries. Depending on, on the commentator, it may include military conquest, gunboat diplomacy, unequal treaties, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and, and, and it goes on, the next paragraph, the policy of U.S. imperialism um, it's attributed to the late 19th century. The government of the U.S. has never referred to itself as an empire, but some commentators refer to it as such, right? And then at the end, the United States has also been accused of neocolonialism, sometimes referred to as a modern <coughs> form of hegemony that uses economic rather than military powers, and sometimes is used as a synonym for contemporary imperialism. So, I mean, everything that's being described there, I don't disagree with that, you know, being part of what defines U.S. foreign policy, but there is a complete erasure of U.S. territories and U.S. imperialism. And there's a couple of things that, that I think, um, there's several problems that this poses for building a progressive leftist politics. Um, First of all, is that probably a lot of people look at this map, look at, at you know, what is the United States um, mainland or the continent or what I refer to as the 50 states. I, I, I move between thinking and talking about continental U.S. in moments where I do want to leave out Alaska and Hawaii because there's ways in which Alaska and Hawaii are, are often question marks in certain forms of, of U.S. policies. Um, or I, I just say the 50 states, because the, the United States is, is a, a name that actually is a misnomer because this is not actually a federation of states. The, the United States is an imperial archipelago, say it with me, <laughs> imperial archipelago that includes states and territories. Um, so even in its name, the territories are erased out. But so the other thing is that I know a lot of people will look at this map and see that there are these big land masses and then there are these little specks. And so that's, I think, one of the first uh, problems for thinking about a politics of the many. What about the few? You know, so we think of the few as the elites, but sometimes the few are the minority, right? And so how can we bring the perspectives of what might be seen as the few into thinking about um, a progressive politics? Um, so then, so that's, that's one, one problem. Another problem, and I have to say this, I feel for um, mainstream US progressive white left folk, because it, you know, you're kind of screwed when it comes to talking about how to bring in Puerto Rico. <coughs> for example, if you say that you don't support race, that you don't support statehood, um, you might seem like a racist. Like you don't want to incorporate, you know, Puerto Rico. And often uh, Trump says, oh no, you, they can't be a state in a way that is uh, clearly xenophobic, aporophobic, et cetera. But then when you, if you say you want, you do support statehood, that's also problematic because what has statehood brought for places like Hawaii and Alaska and New Mexico? The truth is it has re resulted in gentrification and genocide and that there is still a, a great deal of controversy around Hawaiian statehood, for example, and a movement for sovereignty there. 
So then, if and if you, if and if you take seriously the way uh, folks in Puerto Rico historically have thought about statehood, part of the idea that they had of statehood was of the United States as looking something more like the European Union in the sense of being a federation of sovereign post-colonial post, you know, sovereign post-colonial nations in the Americas. And so to take that seriously would really require rethinking the notion of states' rights. And so the folks in Puerto Rico who want statehood, what they want is greater sovereignty. And so what would it, do we want to increase state rights? And what would that look like for the United States? And how does that point to some fundamental problems um, in the formation of the United States that, that has never really thought about the territory, right? And then, okay, well, what if, okay, well, never mind statehood, well, what if we support independence? Well, again, you might look like a racist because you might look like you're just trying to ditch a bankrupt, hurricane ravaged society, right? So nobody wants to do that. Um, and the, the other problem is that for a lot of Puerto Ricans right now, independence looks like bailing on us in our worst moment after you experimented on us, um, extracted wealth from us, crippled our economy. And so how do you create a project of independence that also takes into account that at this point, after the US has promoted the displacement and migration of Puerto Ricans, there are more Puerto Ricans living in the 50 states than there are living on the territory. So what would independence look like in that context? Now, I have to say that given that complexity, I understand why politicians like Bernie Sanders, when asked about what they support for statehood, they say, well, whatever they want, whatever they want, I support it. Um, but, that is, yeah, and that's, but And that's not particular to Bernie. Uh, almost all politicians when, uh, from the US presidential candidates, et cetera, when they go to Puerto Rico, they say, oh, what I support is whatever Puerto Ricans want. We support, you know, self-determination and, you know, but that, uh, uh, most Puerto Ricans know that that is BS because the, there are certain political formulas that Puerto Ricans might want or that territorial citizens might want that might be fundamentally opposed to the US system that might include, you know, include passports and include other forms of benefits uh, while retaining our sovereignty, et cetera. So that's, and again, that's why in my tweet I say, why don't we shift the burden from Puerto Ricans as citizens or colonial subjects and look at the U.S. as an empire. Why does it have the situation it has with Puerto Rico? Why does why has the U.S. always placed Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Samoa, Guam, etc., outside of the possibilities of statehood? And how is that political status beneficial to the United States as an empire? Now I am I'm, I'm wrapping I'm wrapping up, but I <coughs> want to say that um, there was a lot there was a big spotlight. Ooh, oh, I, I, I wait, I, I am, there was one more slide. Um, there was a lot of focus on Puerto Rico recently after the big um, summer movement. Oh, I'm missing a slide. It was a good one. Sorry about that. <laughs> after the summer where there was a massive populist, I don't know, popular uh, mass movement in Puerto Rico um, that you know led to the resignation of the governor. And here are two memes. I think that memes are as important as survey data and other forms of data, right? We're thinking about uh, politics in Puerto Rico. So the first one is um, a, a picture of a kind of governatorial portrait uh, like in a DMV or somewhere like that because there was a movement that went viral of a middle-aged lady who marched into a DMV and took down the picture of the governor and said you're fired. Um, to the tune of a Bad Bunny song, which is really mm -hmm. essential. Um, and so for a while, you know, so the, the governor is in the trash can, his picture's in the trash can, and then there was this power vacuum where all these other uh, politicians wanted to take over the governorship um, because that's something that you know is really important about this movement. People are like, well, they want to get rid of the governor, but who do they want to replace him? And the fact is that they didn't want any of these folks to replace him. Um, and I and people said, oh, but they're kind of they don't have a clear politics. I'm like, yeah, and that's really bold. It's really bold to say we know we don't want you, and we're not sure what we want, but you gotta go. 
And so uh, I love this meme because it's, you know, it came out of the time when all these people were jockeying for power, and what is put in the place of the gubernatorial portrait is a picture of the people, mm -hmm. of the people marching during the movement. <coughs> um, and this is a meme, um, I, I mean, it was hard to pick one, but I, uh, this meme, I think, speaks to the uh, politics of anti-elitism, because you have the, the governor's head chopped off as if you know, from a guillotine, right? Um, so I think there are ways in which this movement um, evokes ideas of populism. And so, of course, a lot of people in the United States became really interested in this. Um, and there was another meme that came out that was like, if you want to get rid of your politician, call 1-800-BORIQUA, and we will, we will help you out, right? Um, so it was, it was exciting to be seen as a model, you know? And a lot of people were even like teasing, like, ha ha, how long have you been trying to get rid of Trump, and look how quickly we got rid of our dude. Um, but this, this tweet, and I, I really annoyed me, so David, who former Obama advisor, hope some of the amazing organizers in Puerto Rico, if they are interested, bring their talents to Florida in 2020. And I couldn't, I couldn't help but leave the comment there, right? Um, so the reason why this annoyed so many people is that is this kind of immediate turn to try to appropriate, you know, the movement and to, to displace our targets of power. I mean, some of the other, I, I think I, I retweeted it and said, um, yeah, we're busy cleaning up our own house. You clean up your mess, you know, because this is something that uh, Puerto Ricans have been Constantly, they're constantly courted once they arrive in the U.S. to engage in political politics, to help, uh, you know, topple Trump or topple, topple whichever uh, politician. And uh, the mayor of San Juan, who kind of went a little bit viral after the hurricane, now she's in the Bernie Sanders campaign. And a, a huge silence in all of this is that Puerto Ricans on the island don't vote. We don't have the right to vote. So to then ask us, instead of engaging with our problems, possibly thinking about whether we should vote for our imperial president or not, the move is quickly to come and help the U.S. with their problems. So I want to end, and this is uh, different for me, I want to end with policy recommendations or something, just something anthropologists don't usually do. So these um, things, like what, what do we want, how do we move forward, what are kind of three lessons to take away? Um, so first, and for me, most important, end the structural silence around U.S. colonialism and empire. Um, think about that Wikipedia uh, entry, you know, the silence that, is, that exists and that, you know, carries through the entire U.S. public education system. I, I, when I teach at the, at the university level, so many of my students are like, oh, they don't know anything about Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, they're not taught about you know, US, US, a U.S. history that includes Puerto Rico. So I know there's a lot of educators here um, include Puerto Rico in your in your classes and its history. And also not like as a as a side an aside or a side note, but how the U.S. the, the legal incorporation of Puerto Rico is fundamentally tied to uh, the the. Um, questions of an unequal inclusion within the United States. So I routinely give talks at law schools, et cetera, and, uh, and you know, all these law students complain to me that they don't get any, any courses on territorial law. Like it's just a, like a non-thing. Um, and so it's, it's relationship to, for example, um, definitions of Native American sovereignty you know, uh, in, in these important Supreme Court cases, the US, the Puerto Rico is described as foreign in a domestic sense while Native Americans are described as domestic in a foreign sense. Um, so that kind of entanglement and the, the way in which the case law that, that talks about Puerto Ricans as alien races, which is part of why they can't be placed on the path to statehood, it uh, draws directly also from Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, so these are the, the, the structural and forceful and purposeful silence of uh, Puerto Rican history, imperial history in general, because it's not just about Puerto Rico, is really essential and shouldn't be a kind of add-on, right? It should be central to this. Which takes takes me a little bit to my second point. I was gonna be cheeky at first and just say don't include us. But um, <laughs> rethink inclusion, right? So what does it mean to to include? Um, especially keeping in mind the how in, what inclusion has led to, what has the extension of rights to minorities in the United States led to? Has it solved the problems of structural racism and the legacies of colonialism? So, and, and I think this also, again, a question for thinking about populist movements, 
um, how do you include minority groups, you know, in, in a way that, that centers their experiences and I think part of the fear of populism is that it's thought of as a mass movement that serves the majority. So what if you're in a minority perspective, where does that leave us? Um, and uh, lastly, which is why I, I felt uh, so much, uh, that there was so much connection with Essie's paper, um, to rethink populism beyond a national us, right? So what does it mean to, to question the, the national project of the United States? So we know it's founded in imperialism and white supremacy, so how do we move to an us that doesn't reinscribe that national imperial project? So I'm, uh, thank you for all these wonderful uh, co-presentations. So I am new to this panel, newly added to this panel. I'm filling in for Tenjiwe McHarris. Uh, so I, and, and so much has been said, and I said so much earlier in the day. So I'm going to be brief so that we have some time for um, discussion. I want to make um, six, I think, short points. Um, I think when I think about that big, and I'm going to be brief not because I don't want a lot. Right, or that we don't need a lot. We need a lie, it's a long list. Um, but when I think about what we want, it really goes back to the question which both um, Yarimar and Aziz uh, pointed to is who is the we? Uh, and I think we can't, uh, we can't get around that. And I liked um, um, Yarimar's uh, provocation that we have to not only think of we the many, but we have to think of the few, right? So the many and the few people who are marginalized, people who are in smaller numbers, uh, people who are not that sort of either mythical, homogenized, uh, 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 common person or the center. And that, of course, ends up being um, colonized people, people of color, LGBTQ people, women, uh, a whole bunch of folks. Um, I also think in terms of, of, of thinking beyond the borders uh, of the United States, which is really uh, important, um, I think that thinking beyond borders, demanding we transcend borders in our thinking and our politic is a non-reformist reform. And the question we have to ask, what does a strategy look like that beyond uh, a rhetorical strategy that, that kind of um, gets us there? Um, the, the second thing I want to raise, so, so the first question is around who is, who is the we and how do we devise a notion of a we that includes the many and the few um, and, and transcends borders. And the second, is um, you know it's it's much easier to say what we're against than what we're for, and I think there are a lot of really powerful lessons. I appreciated um, the situation about um, Puerto Rico to say we, we we at least know we don't want this, but I think there's also dangers in that that we've seen historically, and and you know what comes to mind very recent, recently is Egypt, where uh, you have you know just. I mean, it breaks my heart to even say it again. You know, these, these beautiful, determined, um, uh, young and older people in Tahrir Square, um, you know, creating community, uh, you know, making great sacrifice to kick out Mubarak. Um, they were all on the same page with that. They accomplished that. It felt like this great moment of victory. And now many of the leaders of that struggle are uh, in exile, in jail, or dead. Um, and, and, and that's because into that void, th there wasn't the strength and the unity and the clarity uh, uh, to, um, you know, in a collective way, determine what would come next. Now, that is, not to say that, that is not to say that enormous violence against them precluded that, right? But we have to anticipate that. You know, the people who held on to power this long aren't going to just say, oh, you have a better idea, go ahead, right? It's going to be... Um, um, a, a lot of violent contestation. So, you know, how do we how do we um, plan for that? How do we build that consensus? How do we have that uh, that plan B uh, when we take down that what we, that that which we are against? Um, how do we build enough unity in the process of abolishing that we also are immediately um, prepared to build? Um, the the third point uh, that that comes to mind is. Um, you know, Amna said earlier that we're no longer, that in the 60s, and I was in many of those debates about reform versus revolution, so I know what you're talking about. And it's not the same debate in the same way, uh, but for me, it's not, it's not completely different debate. I don't think we're just talking about reform. I think in many ways, and I'll, my point four is about this, in many ways we are, many of us, understanding that nothing short of revolutionary change will save us. 
Um, and, uh, but, uh, but I think we're rethinking what revolution means, right? When I was 18, I knew what it meant, when it was gonna happen. Um, but that didn't work out. Um, so, uh, but so, so thinking of revolution not in as, a, as an event and a spectacle uh, and a moment, but as a process and as a multifaceted uh, process of transformation. So, you know, looking at non-reformist reforms, but also looking at reforms that ameliorate suffering and give us breathing room and eliminate repression. You know, we we sometimes underestimate or we don't look. Uh, in this country carefully enough at the Cold War. I mean, I spent time studying, you know, what happened to the black left under the C Cold War, and it wasn't pretty. Uh, you know, people's lives were destroyed in, in all kinds of ways, and, and the people doing that work, the state was pretty ruthless. So, um, you know, so, so, so it's no small thing to say we want to, um, uh, to, to hold back various kinds of repressive measures, even though those may be reform measures, uh, to give people breathing room to do organizing, I think that's important. But non-reformist re reforms um, undermine the logic of the system, push us to imagine something better, something different, something bigger. Um, which, which leads me to my fourth point, which is, you know, I, I not just I, many people um, think racial capitalism is in a fundamental crisis, not a cyclical crisis. Um, and that manifests in a number of ways. And I, and I should say I have more arguments with the left about this than, you know, than, than I think maybe with some capitalists. I don't argue with them that much. But, um, but you know, you think of some, somebody like Robert Reich, who's, who's, a, who's a liberal and a capitalist. You know, his book, Saving Capitalism. It's all about capitalism is in trouble, y'all, and we better get to saving it. So, um, you know, a whole number of other people, the, uh, what's the guy's name now? The CEO of Salesforce, Benioff. Uh, has a uh, page, uh, a piece in the op-ed of New York Times a couple weeks ago where he says, capitalism's been good to me. I'm a billionaire, you know, I, I live good, but you know what, capitalism as we know it is dead. Now, he's not quite right, but he's close, um, that it can't sustain itself. Um, and so that means, you know, back to Mo's original um, uh, juxtaposition of it's socialism or it's something post-capitalism, right, or it's, catastrophe, I think, is, um, is not an exaggeration. I think there are a, a few things, and this is an, a real oversimplification, but climate is one. You know, the logic of capitalism is growth, growth, mindless growth, right? Um, every success is measured by growth, um, but we have an infinite growth economy on a finite planet, and, and even, you know, greedy, blind, greedy capitalists are realizing that. Um, robotization. Capitalism always creates new labor-saving technologies, but often there's new industries that absorb that labor that's displaced, etc. Um, my father worked on the assembly line in Detroit for, for many years, so there's robots now doing that work. Robots that don't buy cars. So, um, so, so that creates a, a, a kind of tension in the way that, the, I mean, many of the people who would be doing the job of those robots are actually in, in prison. So there's a relation there in where that surplus labor um, is going. And the other is financialization, which I still think that uh, profit comes from the exploitation of labor, but this creation and growth of a financial class within the capitalist class in this country is an is a important new development. So you have basically hedge fund billionaires who are making money, um, moving money around with smoke and mirrors formulas for doing that also getting lots of people deeper, deeper in debt uh, by betting on the future. Um, and that's kind of a house of cards. It's, it's a very unstable um, formula. So I think those three points of instability are ones we uh, look to when we um, see the writing on the wall that something else has to be put in place. And so it's not just you know, radicals and socialists, but, it, but it's also some of the internal contradictions of capitalism itself. Um, that is creating the opportunity for new possibilities. The fifth point, I just wanted to, you know, it's been invoked a number of times, the vision for black lives, and it's an important document. That document's being um, uh, updated and revised as we speak. But just to remind us that invest-divest model, which is a model of, you know, uh, not just divesting from fossil fuels and prisons and so forth, but investing in communities as a way to solve and address some of the problems that leads to the carceral state um, uh, in the first place. 
Um, the reparations model, you know, Kathy and I are involved in an organization called Scholars for Social Justice, and we've been talking about a reparations agenda, not just for um, government res reparations, but also for universities that have, um, you know, made money off of enslaved labor, uh, made money off displacing and dispossessing uh, black and brown communities, et cetera. There's an official agenda for that, and then there's a kind of unofficial agenda. I mean, many universities have set up uh, commissions and uh, committees and so forth that come up with uh, plans that often don't really cost that much or disrupt the, dislocate the power that much. Uh, but we really would like to, you know, work more closely with activists, which we're doing, um, to talk about what would transformative agendas look like, what would uh, robust reparations um, platforms look like uh, for universities. So. Uh, that's something to think about. And I think we also have to be on guard uh, against models of reparations that are coming out that actually reinforce a kind of neoliberal view of, um, of reparations, if you can imagine, like how, how reparations as a demand can be co-opted for a neoliberal project, which is write you a check and be done with you, right? And that's not, that's not a score to get settled like that. Uh, so um, uh, uh, the one model is one of ARC acknowledgement, restitution, I'm not describing it to anyone, but uh, uh, acknowledgement, restitution, and closure. And it's the closure part I think that's very uh, dangerous, that then like, okay, now, now we're all good, let's, you know, capitalism, everybody can play the game. Um, economic justice is another, um, ending the war on black people, political power, community control, but embedded in that document also um, was uh, an indictment of colonialism settler colonialism and solidarity with the struggle in Palestine, which is what um, uh, we got the most flack for in a way. Uh, and, um, and that's something that I was very proud that people did not back away from. Uh, reproductive rights, you know, health care, et cetera. You know, it's, it is a full-bodied document in terms of um, a starting place for an agenda for liberation and what we want. Um, and I think it's also a process because one of the critiques of that document, which I think was right after it came out, was it didn't have a clear articulation around disability um, issues, right? And so the um, disabilities community sort of came and said, where are we in this? And so people responded uh, positively and tried to, uh, are, 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 you know, redrafting that. The sixth point, um, which, which I, which I want to make is, is just that, you know, how we go about getting what we want um, is as important as what we get, right? The, the means and the end are very important. Some of us were on a call the other day with um, a, a, a number of Kurdish women uh, activists who, whose comrades are being slaughtered in Rojava right now. Um, and they talked about this process of um, creating this semi-autonomous zone called Rojava uh, under, uh, they, they came out of the Kurdish Workers, Workers Party and now um, they're engaged in, the, they were engaged in this process of creating a system they call confederalism. They're anarchist, socialist, feminists. Um, and they were prepared to defend it. I mean, defend it, defend it, right? Not just discursively defend it. Um, but, but, you know, the processes of, of, of empire and military aggression in the world is, is changing that. Uh, significantly, but it is an, an interesting, and I, you know, given what's happening to them, I don't want to just call it interesting, that what they tried to build is as important a lesson for us as how it's being destroyed. Uh, so, um, so I want us to keep that in mind. I think today I'm optimistic about the Rising Majority, which is an organization that, you know, takes a lot of time to make decisions. I get very impatient with that because I'm getting old. I want things to, like, get done you know, while I'm still around. Um, but, but, but participating in an alignment process, really carefully trying to pull in all the actors and all the participants, that process is really important. Um, I, I have a lot of respect for the folks in left groups also, a new um, left uh, political formation that has been um, really exploring this par process of what would a new kind of political party look like. Similarly, Working Families Party, which you know took a hit for its presidential endorsement, but um, but but really arrived at that point, and I got a glimpse of it at a couple meetings that I was at and discussions I was in. You know, tried to be radically inclusive and democratic, and and sometimes that's messy. So I think those um, that those conscious attempts to adhere to democratic practice is as important is, uh, as 
uh, listing and agreeing on what we want to get in the end. So I think I'll stop there. Okay. So not surprisingly, we don't have a lot of time left. I want to take a little bit of moderator privilege to have some reaction, because this mm -hmm. has just been so much and so good and so rich. Um, I would have done it as questions, but then that would leave you zero questions. So I'm just going to do it as, um, you know, as some thoughts. Um, things that really sparked for me, um, the idea of a job guarantee um, as part of the Green New Deal and how that has to go to war with the idea of universal basic income and mm -hmm. what that means that is different. And then also the tension of, the freedom tension of saying you have to work versus here you get money versus the you know solidarity tension of you get to work alongside someone in a project that helps heal your nation versus you get to be at home by yourself on the internet spending cryptocurrency, right? Those are the tensions that I feel in those two visions, right? Um, in this question about what about the few, you know, we've been asking it as a question, and um, and I want to in the what do we want, you know, sort of discipline. I want to um, put forward an idea about newly recommitted, but also newly envisioned universal standards of you know, of life and of liberty to say that the majority, we are now in a populist moment in that things that we in the left want are more popular. So we're like, yay, populism, right? Um, but that will never take, that will never create a majoritarian, particularly not a multiracial populism, can never create a majoritarian hegemony, right? We, we, we can't, we shouldn't, we won't do it. And what it has to be undergirded by is a sense of universal um, human rights, and also universal standards of living, which is somewhere we've never, never gotten. Uh, the national we, right? I mean, this is the big question. Um, we are working so hard to get this country right, and the sense has been like, if we can do it here, right, in a new country that was founded on a lie of racial hierarchy and colonial um, genocide, like if we can do it here, can't other places do it? But I would also trouble that to say, one of the ways that investing in the American, um, the United States as a site of, of transformation might be because soon we are also moving to a place, and we could if we, you know, as the tinkering around immigration happens, um, where there, we reflect the global population. So what would that mean for this country to reflect the global population and really actually deal with the, the rootedness and situationness of, of making a, a table that shares resources and that co-designs some sort of um, city on a hill where there is actually someone from every other community on the globe represented. Um, and does that, um, does that help us think about why this we is worth investing in? Um, and then the other question of, I think Aziz, you did very beautifully talked about like sort of we could have this sort of um, materialist win-win on a lot of foreign policy. Um, and I think the border, you can talk about the, the crisis of, of birth rates that's happening in the United States, and you can totally articulate how not having borders and sort of maximalist population, population would be good for, uh, you know, the domestic economy if, if the benefits and uh, distribution were gotten right. Um, but what I think is the big question that I have about foreign policy um, a multiracial populist foreign policy is, is what are the standards for war and intervention under that vision? Um, because that feels so still hard um, and hard to do a win-win um, as opposed to a moral question. So those are some of the thoughts that I had while I was up here listening. Um, we have, uh, we have, and like damn these people are smart and damn these are the right questions. Um, we have five minutes left in this session. <laughs> I took like four minutes, um, which if anybody knows me, that was good, right? So, um, uh, so why don't we just get a few questions on the table and um, and you know do what we can? Yes. Yeah. Right, so, Dara Grant from the University of Chicago. Uh, Aziz, this is uh, this question is going to be for you, um, though anyone can answer it, but. Um, <laughs> You've obviously written powerfully about the the benefits of a new internationalism before, um, and so I take you to be reiterating at least some of that here. Um, 
and I share the aspiration and the desire and all of the sort of political hopes that go with it, but I wonder if the story of what goes wrong in the Cold War is a little one-sided in your presentation of it. So the way I heard you put it here was that, um, you know, Cold War suppression of uh, internationalism, uh, you know, Cold War ends, presumably more possibility for internationalism is how I see this sort of logic going. But something else disappeared in the Cold War too, which was the international vision that sustained internationalism, not only as a US project, but as a global project, a project where you know, there was as much internationalism, if not more, outside of the United States and in the colonial world than, um, than there was here. And so I just wonder whether or not the loss of that horizon of possibility mm -hmm. um, really can allow for people in, in the United States who have, this, who have struggles of their own to imagine themselves in a solidaristic endeavor else, elsewhere. And this is particularly true, you look at Syria, as you have done a lot, or at uh, Palestine, it's sort of hard, like it's exhausting. It's exhausting to watch the problem just reiterate itself over and over again okay. with very little possibility of transformation. Thank you. Can I get just like one or two more questions on the table? If you have any, but if not, I'm sure Aziz is ready to go. Okay, Aziz. Yeah, no, I, so Will you turn your mic on? Oh, yeah. yeah, so I think that that's... Still, still now working. I think it's ready. Okay. Um, I think that's a really powerful point. So the, the piece that was not in the presentation is that one of the things that sustained third world internationalism was the fact that you had vibrant you know, anti-colonial movements mm -hmm. um, across, uh, across the world. And indeed, I mean, that, that provided real sustenance to black radical politics. It provided an alternative account of community. You know, where is it that the Du Bois um, leaves when he's essentially forced into exile? He's in Ghana with Nkrumah. Um, and so there's no doubt that that actually built uh, a sense of real solidarity that didn't have to rely on the nation state. And you could say the same thing about uh, the international workers movement and the ways in which that constructed a sense of community. Like one of the things that I think is, is sort of moving for me, you know, so I've been doing some research and reading in the International Socialist Review, which is from Chicago, the central left wing of the Socialist Party newspaper in the early 20th century. It's a white institution. They had labor around the world as like one of the portions of the newspaper, every issue. And, the, and around the world was around the world. It's like, what's happening in Mexico? What's happening in Japan? And it was a clear way in which class politics, rather than being something that's confrontational with race, was actually facilitating a move against white solidarity and thinking of these broader, broader communities. Now, there are two big things that happened. One is um, the fact that you know, there are real problems that have to be confronted about what, what the, the reality of many of those third world independence projects. Mm -hmm. Nkrumah becomes increasingly mm -hmm. authoritarian. My family's from Kenya. You know, um, Kenyatta is no hero in terms of the politics that he ended up generating. And it's very difficult to then think of solidarity if the folks that you're in alliance with end up generating deeply regressive politics. And then the second thing is it was really hard even then to know who you're in solidarity with. So a colleague of mine who does wonderful work on the black radical tradition, this is Russell Rickford, so a colleague of both Jason and mine, he's been writing about African-American efforts to make sense of politics in Southern Africa in the 70s. So like Angola. So you know that, so the Portuguese are ostensibly defeated, and now the country is in a civil war, and there are different sides. To, from our vantage point today, there's a recognition that UNITA, one of those sides, like those are the folks that were allied with uh, apartheid South Africa um, and should be opposed. But at the moment, it's really hard to know about the terms of your own country, let alone the internal party formations in Angola. And what I would say about the present is, in many ways, you're right that there's been a decline of general internationalism. But there's also been, over the last two decades plus, from the anti-globalization protests to the politics of anti-austerity to the connections between Tahrir and Wisconsin, Podemos and Sanders, a revival of internationalism. And what we're dealing with are versions of the same basic problems, which is the nation state politics in other countries are themselves regressive. And it's really hard to understand how to intervene internally within those politics. And what that to me suggests is these are perennial challenges, and they're perennial challenges that require building collaborative institutions and you know, developing 
forms of solidarity and alliance that are not state driven, that are based on social movement activism ac across these countries. And then it also means making specific kinds of demands against the state. And this is where it comes to the point about war, which is I think it's really important to separate between what an independent foreign policy of a social movement is and what you want a state, which mm -hmm. is a national security and corporate mm -hmm. state to be doing. And for example, in a context like Syria, but across the Middle East and many other interventionist settings, I wouldn't say that the, the solution is just absolute isolationism or a kind of sovereigntist anti-intervention position, but it should be organized around the principle of do no harm, which is a, a commitment for the state to limit, not to think about like, you know, what red lines will be crossed that require military force, but like, well, what will actually be the consequences of using military force? And respecting the international legal prohibitions against various forms of aggressive violence. And that means, let's say for us, I think it, it entails saying um, as a basic part of a platform, end military aid to Saudi Arabia and Israel. Um, count accurately and completely civilian casualties in all conflicts that we're involved with. Don't use drones um, and drone attacks outside of declared armed conflicts. Don't use sanctions as a mechanism of essentially impoverishing um, foreign communities. Commit to nuclear and other forms uh, of disarmament, and on and on and on. So there are concrete ways in which you can have an anti-militarist agenda that you demand of the state, even as you're building social movement alliances. Sorry I went on. Thank you. All right, we have to wrap and I believe take a break before the 315 next panel. Please thank the panelists.